Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, it's always kind of nerve wracking being on these things on Zoom. So um, especially when we're in a spiritual setting, I appreciate the um, spirit and energy that moves in shared spaces. So I hope that um, virtually we're able to um, also share some of that energy. Um, the way that you opened was so important. And so thank you for saying names. Thank you for speaking names. Thank you for reading that verse, which is my favorite Bible verse um, and the one that really inspired. Um, I guess this is a sermon. I'm not usually invited into churches to give sermons. Um, but I guess increasingly people are recognizing what we recognize in Black Lives Matter, that Black Lives Matter is not simply a social justice movement, not simply a racial justice movement, but is a spiritual movement. And so what I wanna talk about today, um, I wanna open in a few additional names because we often um, uh, open in the names of folks who we've heard of, who've garnered national media attention, but very rarely, I know you all are in Carlsbad, so you've heard the name, um, but very rarely do we call on Alfred Alango, do we call his name? Um, very rarely do people call out the name Michelle Shirley. Very rarely do they call the name Mytrice Richardson and A.J. Weber and Dejan Kizzee. Um, but all of these names are of people who've been killed right here in California at the hands of the state. And then of course, um, in a Christian church, we have to remember that it's also in line with honoring um, Jesus the Christ and saying that we have to fight back against state violence because Jesus was one of the first people killed by the state, murdered by the state. And um, if, folks are calling themselves Christians, it's incumbent upon us, it's our sacred duty to topple systems that steal the lives of our people for doing work, for walking while black, for living while black, for living their lives and disallowing them um, to evolve into their fullest self and uh, into who God intends them to be. And so um, what I wanna speak about is that it's not enough to just say Black Lives Matter. We have to make Black Lives Matter. We have to make Black Lives Matter. And for me, that's how the um, Bible verse that faith without works is dead translates, right? So many of you know that Black Lives Matter was founded July 13th, 2013. That was the day that George Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin. And um, many of us in Los Angeles, and uh, I don't know if Pastor Shockley was still in LA then, but many of you all will know that in Los Angeles, the city erupted. We answered um, that question that Langston Hughes po posed, right? What happens to a dream deferred? And then he asked at the end of that poem, does it explode? It absolutely explodes. And so thousands upon thousands of us flooded the streets of Los Angeles, flooded the Crenshaw area where I live and um, committed ourselves to doing work that transforms the world. And initially for the first several days, this was an intuitive movement. We marched, um, we were very clear, however, from the very beginning um, and in Black Los Angeles, there's one place that we used to assemble before they put gates up around it, which was Lamert Park. And, um, you know, we didn't need a call. We didn't need a text. We didn't need a Facebook post. When we got word that George Zimmerman, the wannabe white, wannabe um, uh, security, wannabe police officer, um, was acquitted in the murder of our 17-year-old collective son, Trayvon Martin. We erupted, we were outraged, we were sorrowful, we were um, shattered. And so we went to the place where Black Los Angeles goes, which is Lamert Park. 
And so July 13th, 2013, that evening, we gathered in the park and many of us were crying. We were sharing stories. We were yelling. We were screaming. We were chanting. And then finally, I remember I was there and this young sister said to me, I don't want to be in this park anymore. And I said, okay, sis, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to march. And so um, I had a bullhorn in my hand. And I always tell my students um, who are in my activism classes, if you want to be an activist, the first investment that you must make is in a bullhorn. And so I got on the bullhorn and I said, so we're going to march. And then here's the deliberate piece of it, though. There was actually some conversation about which way we were going to march. Because if you go south down Crenshaw, it becomes blacker and poorer. And if you go north up Crenshaw, it deadens into Wilshire Boulevard, which becomes whiter and more affluent. And I remember there was one sister in the crowd who wanted to march south. And I had seen what happened. I wasn't yet in Los Angeles. I was a teenager when uh, the 92 uprisings happened. And I remembered seeing images of people marching and uh, rising up in South Los Angeles and the powers that be weren't as concerned about the revolt that happened in South Los Angeles because they pretty much saw those properties in that space as black space. And we knew that if we'd moved north, moved into whiter and more affluent spaces, they'd be much more concerned. And so we were able to usher this crowd of thousands to move north. And I was in this park with what I call the Mama Brigade, three other um, moms who you know, went with us. We, we all gathered and went together to Lamert Park. And we began to move north and shut things down in wider, more affluent spaces in Los Angeles for a period of three days. And on the third day, as we were continuing to disrupt spaces, recognizing that the pain and the trauma and the um, outrage that we were experiencing as Black people couldn't simply be confined to Black people or no one would care, right? So we shut down spaces like Hollywood and Highland, like the exposition line, the new train line that brought people from uh, suburbs to the sea. It was what the uh, mayor called the subway to the sea. And so we were trying to disrupt that space. Um, on the third day, we shut down the 10 freeway. And as I was standing on that freeway overpass with my three children, um, who at the time were three, six, and nine years old, um, I received a text message from our beloved co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Um, it originated with her. Her name is Patrice Colors. And it asked us to gather in her Black artist community, the community in which she was living, called St. Elmo's Village. And there we gathered. So I, I brought the Mama Brigade, some of the members of the Mama Brigade, along with um, my my children, my birth children, as well as who I call my spirit children. Many of the young people who um, are enrolled in Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. And we gathered under the moonlight and pledged to build a movement, not a moment. A movement, not a moment. Now, Patrice had been in conversation with Alicia Garza and Opal Tometi, who I didn't know at the time, but have come to know over this last seven and a half years, and I'm so grateful for their vision. Um, in building a movement, not a moment, what we recognized is that this system that put a target on Trayvon Martin's back and on Mike Brown's back and on Alfred Alango's back and on Dijon Kazee's back and on Riddell Jones' back and on Breonna Taylor's back, it wasn't by accident. These systems are deliberately and intentionally designed to bring the demise of Black people. And so we have to upend that system. That's what it means to build a movement, not a moment. It means that we can't just fight for justice in the name of the most recent hashtag. It has to be a recognition that the system of policing under which we live actually evolves from slave catching. And so as ridiculous as it would sound to say, let's just reform chattel slavery, 
That's the same ridiculousness with which we, we must greet people who say, let's just tinker around the edges of policing. Policing is a vestige of chattel slavery and it is not the way in which we keep communities safe in a genuine manner. And so we have to be bold and courageous in saying, defund the police and in saying reimagine public safety because public safety for black people especially has never been at the through a gun and a badge and so it's really important that we lift that up so from 2013 on we've been struggling in black lives matter to un upend a system that intentionally and deliberately puts targets on our backs but it was about a year in to the Black Lives Matter movement that we, we that we recognize that it's not just a racial justice movement, not just a social justice movement, but it's also a spiritual movement. And I'm going to tell a quick story. I'm going to check my time. But I'm going to tell a very quick story that kind of ushered us into that realization. So in August of 2014, a beloved brother named Ezell Fort was murdered here in Los Angeles by two LAPD officers, Charlton Wampler and Antonio Villegas. And just as we say the name to give honor to Ezell Ford and to all of those whose bodies have been stolen by police violence, I think it's also important that we expose the murderous police um, so that we can keep ourselves safe and our communities safe from them because too often the criminal system of injustice allows these same officers to continue to be on our streets. Charlton Wampler was a known abuser of South Los Angeles communities and he was not fired, he was not disciplined, he was not arrested, he was not prosecuted, he was not imprisoned for the theft of Ezell Ford's life. Neither was Antonio Villegas. So we need to know who they are so that we can keep our communities safe. So after Ezell was murdered by these two officers, um, we began to struggle for justice for him. And it took a period of months for us to finally get the autopsy report released to the public. And when we got that autopsy report released, it affirmed what the community always said is true. And I think it's an important um, learning experience, especially for those of you who are not black and have not had black experiences with law enforcement. We're often conditioned to believe that law enforcement is the truthful one and communities are somehow conspiring or behaving criminally, especially when we talk about black communities. But those of us who live in black communities, those of us who are black, those of us who are the lions rather than the hunters under the African proverb, right? Until the lion tells the story, the hunter will always be the hero. Right, those of us who are lions know to listen to the roars, listen to the rumblings of other lions, because that's where our truth lies. And so in Ezell Ford's community, they had been saying that Charlton Wampler was a serial abuser of the community. They had been saying that they um, followed and stopped and harassed Ezell, and they said that they stole Ezell's life in cold blood. And we believed the community. So from August 2014 onward, we believed the community. But the rest of the world believed the lies that were being developed by LAPD. And so finally, when we got the autopsy report released, it confirmed what the community knew to be true. It confirmed that the lion story was the one that was true, not the hunters, right? And so what we learned is that um, Ezell Ford was shot point blank in the back. There was a muzzle imprint in his back. And so once we saw that, we began the first so-called occupation. We now call them decolonizations, but we began the first occupation of the Black Lives Matter movement. We took over the front of LAPD headquarters for a period of 18 days. And we were trying to um, expose what had happened to Ezell. And I remember we had called in media because we wanted to have um, a press conference around some new findings in Ezell's case. 
And it was the coldest winter ever in Los Angeles. I know that you're not going to believe us because it's LA. It's always warm, right? But it was cold this, um, this winter. And, you know, not like Los Angeles at all. In fact, in our decolonization, we needed hand warmers. Until then, I ne never even knew there was something called hand warmers. But we needed hand warmers to keep warm in Los Angeles as we camped out in front of LAPD headquarters. And so I got a little sick. A lot of us got sick. Um, but we still had this press conference coming. And so I went home to get ready for the press conference, take a shower, get dressed. And as I was there, I prayed and I said, okay, God, I'm just going to need you to get me well enough through this to get through this press conference. And I said, I'm calling on you, Ezel. I need you to help me. And instantly, and I'm speaking to spiritual people, so I won't shy away from the truth of what happened. Instantly, I felt the spirit overtake me and I heard audibly something go, Shh. and I was completely well in an instant. Went out, had the press conference, it went well, we were able to um, share what had happened to Ezel. We were able to get our message out but what it did in that moment is remind us that movements for social justice and racial justice are never simply movements that happen um, through the methods that most social justice and racial justice advocates would claim, right? That they're always grounded in spirit. When we think about movements to end um, not just chattel slavery in this country, but around the world. Let's think about Haiti. How did Toussaint L'Ouverture engage and defeat the French, right? When we think about the movement to end chattel slavery in this country, Mama Harriet Tubman said that the word of God, the voice of God spoke to her and charted her course, charted her path so that she was able to free more than a thousand folks. I know that you're saying your textbook teaches you, your textbooks growing up taught you that Mama Harriet Tubman freed 300 enslaved people. But if we think about the Combahee River raid alone, that was 700 people. So let's add those two numbers together and say it was at least a thousand people that Mama Harriet Tubman was personally responsible for freeing because she heard and heeded the voice of God. When we think about Mama Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell and others, they began their work. The Black Women's Club efforts began their work in the church, right? When we think about the civil rights movement, there's a re reason that all those meetings happened in church basements and so many pastors were involved in that work. And so it's important to remember that spirit has a place in social justice movement. Spirit, God, has to be at the center of our work to transform the world because we're not gonna achieve transformation just by works alone. So that Bible, James, uh, the, the book of James is teaching us that faith and works are essential, that we have to have faith. And so when we stepped into this work, realized that in 2014, we began to harness our spiritual tools. We began to remember that it's people who walked before us who continue to lend spiritual energy to this world, right? That we have to remember that the residue of the incredible work of people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells and Afini Shakur are not gone. There's still residue here that when we say names of people whose bodies have been stolen, we're actually seeking to do righteous work in their honor. And so it's important to remember that faith stands at the center of this work. But that verse also teaches us faith without works is dead. So it's not enough to say, we're going to say these names. It's not enough to say, yes, we uplift and honor the work of Martin Luther King and other freedom fighters who walked before us. It's not enough to say, yes, God wants justice on this earth. That verse also says, how are you going to do work? So how are we not just going to say 
Black Lives Matter, but how are we going to make Black Lives Matter? So I think it's wonderful that you're doing an entire series on Black Lives Matter at Pilgrim UCC. However, beyond what we talk about, beyond what you learn in this space, I think it's wonderful that your church asked me for reading recommendations um, in addition to uh, the Bible verse, right? I think it's wonderful that hopefully you are all are engaging in works like Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. However, after you read the books, after you pray and as you pray, you also have to think about, we also have to think about what work will we do? Are we gonna just ask hungry people to take care of themselves or are we gonna take care of each other? Are we gonna just say Black Lives Matter and mourn the loss of seven-year-old Ayanna Stanley Jones? Are we just gonna put up pictures of Breonna Taylor? Are we just gonna say it's tragic that Tamir Rice at 12 years old wasn't allowed to play in a park? Are we gonna sit here and just talk about how this world is being moved towards um, a devilish and evil form of white supremacy? White supremacy is evil, you all. I know that it's, um, there's a lot of folks who are talking about the white supremacist who occupies the White House as being crazy or now sick or um, not smart, but that's not what it is. What it is, this kind of white supremacy that's being whipped up right now is evil. And so are we just gonna proclaim it as evil or are we gonna do something to beat it back? We have a sacred duty to end evil, to end white supremacy, to end racism, to end systems that put black people in cages and put targets on our backs. We have a sacred duty. And so it means that as we kind of garner our energy, as we develop our intellectual tools through readings and conversations, as we shore ourselves up spiritually by having spaces like this, that we also have to lift up our own voices. We need you to do three things. We need you to use your voice. We need it to be not just people like me, not just people like Patrice, not just people like Alicia, not just people like Opal, not just people like the thousands upon thousands of people who have made Black Lives Matter the largest movement in global history. And some of you have been out in these streets too, right? Um, but we need you, all of you, to lift your voices and say what we mean when we say Black Lives Matter, to say unabashedly, Yes, we mean defund the police. What do you think defund the police means? Defund the police means take their money and invest it in things that actually make communities safe, like housing for everyone, like healthy food for everyone, like good jobs for everyone, like quality education and after school programs. You know, if you do your research, we know that it's illogical that most cities are spending upwards of 50% of their general fund on police when police are not qualified to solve these problems that actually create unsafe communities. Police are not qualified to be mental health providers or to be tutors for our young people. Police are not qualified to make sure that people have housing. Police are not qualified to be drug rehabilitation um, providers. Police are not qualified to do these things. Also, police are not even effective at doing the things that we charge them to do. And so it's important that we read the literature that says there's a new study out that says that police only solve about 2% of their violent crimes. And so when we think about what they, that means in their actual jobs, police are only successful about 2% of the time. So when we think about what that means, it means that we're over investing on a back end when we should be investing on the front end. If we really want to create safe communities, we'll make sure everyone has housing, right? If we really want to create safe communities, we'll create spaces for children to go after school, right? And so it's important that we reimagine public safety, that we recognize that strong community is what keeps people safe. It's what keeps 
communities safe. It's what keeps our children safe. And so we have to lift our voices to say, yes, they absolutely said defund the police and reimagine public safety. And this is what it means. We need everyone to make that proclamation. We also need you to put your bodies on the line. And that means not just turning out for the mass uprisings in the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's murder at the hands of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. It means all the time. It means whenever you see an injustice. I'm inspired by um, the work of one of our allies yesterday. Um, yesterday, we had a really beautiful um, gathering called Black Women Are Divine. It was a reclamation in honor of Breonna Taylor, reminding us that Black women are not who the world tells us we are. Black women are not mules. Sorry about that. Black women are not mules. Black women are divine. It is through Black women that um, the vision for this world is often manifested. And so it's important that we step into our divinity, that we reclaim our divinity, and that all of you all who are not Black women also recognize our divinity. Black women are not the mules of the world, despite what the world tries to make us. We are divine. So we had this beautiful gathering, a space of healing and nurturing and love. And one of our allies who was there and um, lots of non-Black um, folks, lots of men and non-women came and joined that space to um, provide childcare for our children, to um, do activities with us and for us, to give us flowers while we're alive. And one of our allies um, had to make a run. I think he was going to pick up ice or something. And as he was out, he witnessed many cop cars pulling over a black man while stopping a black man, dragging him from his vehicle. And the black man that they were dragging had a seizure. They left him to seize out on the hot concrete. It was about 98 degrees yesterday and refused to give him water when he came to. Um, but then said they were there stopping him and handcuffing him and arresting him for an expired driver's license. This is how they treated a black man for an expired driver's license. And so our brother, our ally, put his body on the line to make sure that there were no knees in the neck of this black man. You as non-black people, we need you to put your bodies on the line as well. When you see something happening in your neighborhood, when you see police pulling people over in your neighborhood, we need you to stop and put your body on the line. We need you to videotape it and we need you to intervene when you can. Say that this is not right. Yell, this is not right. And make sure that the police know, make sure that the system that puts targets on our back know that we have backup, that there is still you know, an underground railroad in place that includes black folks and non-black folks. So we need your voice, we need your body, and then lastly, we need your resources. We need you to put your money where your mouth is. If you believe Black Lives Matter, how are you making Black Lives Matter? What organizations are you donating to? How are you making sure that Black folks have what they need during this pandemic? How are you participating in mutual aid work? These are the things that we are compelled to do if we really follow God. When we say faith without works are dead, faith without works is dead. It's important that we ground ourselves in faith, but it's also important that we interrogate what kind of work we're actually doing as churches and as individuals. And so I'm grateful to have been provided space to come to you this morning. I'm grateful for the work of your pastor. I'm grateful for all the work that you all have done and will continue to do. And I have faith that we will move forward and usher in a world that meets God's vision where all of us have all of what we need, most of what we want, 
where the targets are taken, up, uh, taken off of our backs, where we can truly honor the names that we spoke this morning, where we can truly honor the freedom fighters that walked before us, and where we can truly honor God with our work. And so it is.